Uh, let's uh, talk about uh, e-commerce growth, which is expected to continue to grow after the pandemic ends. Businesses are pressed to support an increase in volume of cross-border transactions. Application programming, uh, the new singularity leveraging API innovation for cross-border e-commerce growth, explores the use of APIs in cross-border e-commerce payment interfaces, and that can help streamline cross-border payment operations and help financial institutions and e-commerce businesses address the most complex cross-border payment frictions, such as authentication, payments processing, and regulatory compliance. Right here with me, Michael Famarotti, the Chief Economist of uh, Sears, joins me here in the uh, Lagos Studios to discuss cross-border payments. Michael, it's good to see you again. It's been quite a very always. long time. Yes, so here we are, cross-border payments. Nigeria's has come to distinguish itself mm -hmm. in Africa and globally as one of the best in terms of payments Settlements locally, yeah. But when we go cross border, quite some of these issue, some issues could, could develop. So, uh, who needs cross border payments, by the way? Well, I think the key thing to note is that everyone needs it, right? So, the most popular use case is probably remittances, right? Uh, Nigeria receives about twenty billion dollars each year. However, when you think about cross border payments, you're thinking about even the government trying to get euro bonds abroad. You're thinking about um, me trying to pay for a Financial Times subscription. Yeah. And you're thinking about me also, you know, trying to book a quarantine hotel when traveling to the UK. So there are many use cases. Um, and in particular, we focus quite a lot on SME startups and small businesses and cross-border issues affecting them. Mm. Interesting, uh, Michael, just a very quick one here because we've got some uh, 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 breaking news coming through that Equinix has acquired West Africa's uh, main one at 320 million US dollars valuation, giving the US data center investor more exposure to booming connectivity in, in Africa. Main One was founded by Nigerian entrepreneur Funke Okweke, who is the owner of three data centers in the region with a fourth uh, of such data centers under construction. The company has also uh, funding to lay a subsea cable stretching from Portugal to Nigeria, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, with this deal, we are also acquiring additional, and according to the statement just released, probably enough to build another 10 data centers. According to Judith Gardner, Equinix Vice President for Emerging Markets, of course, so there's also an expansion plan, in, according to the statement, uh, that will come online next year and will be concentrating on West Africa. The cash transaction is the first move for Equinix into Africa, which has a predominantly young population with increasing access to the Internet. For main one, the transaction provides the company with access to capital and networks to bolster its expansion plans, according to a statement by Funke Okweke, who will still be heading the company despite this acquisition, $320 million valuation by Equinix acquiring West Africa's main one. Big news in Nigeria's telecommunications, infrastructure, digital space. Michael, this is as big as it gets into your industry. We've seen about $1.2, $1.5 billion inflows into Africa in yeah. terms of digital space and all that. And this is raising the game for Nigeria. Give me your first word on this main one acquisition by, by Equinix, which has just been reported, Equinix, uh, which is listed on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange in the U.S. Yes, so I love it because I think digital infrastructure is something that we tend to forget quite a bit. Um, it's an unsexy industry, but it's key to growing, to growing the digital economy. And I think investments like this in main one are critical, right? So even when we look at cross-border payments and the challenges faced there, a lot of the issues come down to the infrastructure that these transactions are built on, right? So whenever I see investments in that area, I'm always very excited. So it's really good to see. Very good to see because uh, Funke Wicker says, uh, uh, she's saying thank you to the founding shareholders of uh, Main One, Foladiola, Main Street Technologies, Africa Finance Corporation, PDF, uh, First Bank of Nigeria, FBN, Polaris Bank, and of course the African Development Bank for investing in May One Vision to bridge the digital divide in Africa. We need these investments. Yeah. And we look at what Funke Wicker is talking about, saying thank you. These are very big institutions that over the years have supported the vision of what you call digital infrastructure. When you look at big institutions, both locally and Pan-African, such as the AFDB and even some local banks. Yeah, yeah. And it's very important that these institutions are also seen exits as well. Because, you know, with a lot of the money coming in, that's still a question that a few people have, right? When are the exits? Where are they? How are people going to make their 
returns. And the ecosystem is still crying out for a lot of local funding, right, from PFAs, PEs, banks, and so on. And I think when legacy firms like those listed gets returns, um, I think it validates the investment case in it the It makes it economy. interesting for others to, to come in. Definitely. Well, if we uh, move a little bit into B2, B e commerce and what yeah. have you. Yesterday we got Trade Depot reporting $110 million as well in, in Series B funding uh, from including this UK CDC group, the IFC of the World Bank and others. And this means that, look, the, the whole idea of cross border payments, you need the huge infrastructure. Uh, that uh, Min One and others are providing. Then you have those who are doing the B two B e commerce of it. Put it all together for me in terms of how a, a, you can use a chart to talk about the dominance of business to business transaction. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a very good point because, like you said, we have the Min One deal today. Um, earlier this week, we saw Trade Depot raising one hundred and ten million dollars, and a few weeks ago, we saw MFS Africa, and they focus on on cross border payments, and they were raising. Hundred million dollars, and it just shows the amount of potential that um, people are seeing in how to digitize and help small businesses on the continent. Right? Um, take Nigeria for example. There are about forty million of those. Um, they contribute about sixty percent of GDP and employ about eighty percent of the workforce. Right? But of those forty million, about ninety-seven percent of them are businesses with less than 10 workers, right? So there's a lot of growth and scaling potential and a lot of the funding coming in is being channeled in different ways that can unlock the potential of these sm small businesses. And I think outside of FinTech, which obviously we're seeing a lot of <laughs> um, things going on there, that's probably the most exciting part of the ecosystem right now. Uh, for SMEs in Nigeria today, any cross-border payments are they facing any challenges? Uh, I know the EFCFTA is here. So do you think cross-border payments is another layer in some of the challenges that SMEs here face? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the reality is there's no point being able to trade with someone if you can't get payments for your goods and services, right? And you can speak to businesses anecdotally and you get a lot of blowback in terms of difficulties collecting money from customers abroad. But also, you look at it on a macro level, right? Um, there are a few surveys that show that outside funding and credits, um, easy and cheaper cross-border payments is one of the things that small businesses really need. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because once again, these are businesses that are desperate to scale. And because the market size in a lot of countries on the continent isn't particularly large, um, selling across borders becomes very important, right? So. It is a primary challenge. Um, at the moment, I would say that the legacy infrastructure is a bit too expensive for them and isn't built for their kind of high-frequency, low-volume transactions. So, so what, what alternative options do they have? Well, so ultimately, I think now what we're seeing is a lot of innovation um, trying to bring down the cost of, of cross-border payments. Um, you look at success stories like WISE, which unfortunately doesn't operate in <laughs> Nigeria, right now um, but they've been able to reduce the cost by like you know 20 30 times just by focusing on the infrastructure that they use um, the other key thing to note is that the cost of cross-border payments ultimately rests on the institutions involved right because the typical thing is money doesn't actually flow at, at, across borders what happens is um, there's a message that is sent yes. right um, and that then means that local institutions have to have the liquidity to satisfy um, the payments. And that means that institutions like banks, Western Union and so on have had an advantage because they specialize in that. But what we're seeing now is non-traditional institutions like mobile money agents and so on coming into the space. These have lower overheads, so they automatically make the process cheaper, right? And then you see innovations like Bitcoin and crypto also coming into the fold. And all they're trying to do is um, change the channels that the money flows through and the entities involved. And once you do that, you're able to bring costs down. And that's what essentially a lot of these businesses are doing. But, but Michael, who still needs correspondent banking? 
So I think there will still be a big. Has role it been for reduced that. to just mere paperwork? No, where the definitely The fintech guys not. have taken the main, main, the main heat out. Definitely, because when you look at some transactions, right? So say you're looking at a 150 million dollar wire transfer, you still require the highest level of security and checks, right? And in that instance, a five thousand dollar fee is nothing. Right, so I think there will still be a role. <laughs> I'm sure uh, uh, Funke Puke can let a five thousand dollars go exactly. for a three twenty million dollars yeah. transaction because she has to be sure the money is there. Exactly, so there will still be a role for um, Swift one and, and so on. Yes. Mm. And moving forward, even for for SMEs, you think that they can still bear with the cost and all of that with exchange rate and other things? I think so. I think also um, what we see is. Um, legacy players will find ways of competing, right? Because that's a large market that they don't want to just <laughs> let go. go. Exactly. So I think over time it will be a more competitive field, but um, they will still find more joy serving the larger institutions that can bear the cost quite easily. But, but here is this uh, main key question in, in your latest report at Steers Business which is, is technology the only thing, I'm reading that word for word, is technology the only thing that matters? That's the question. What's the answer? No, and you mentioned one of it, right, the dollar issue, right? Yes. Um, and I spoke about WISE um, a few years ago. They were operating in Nigeria. I used to do tr transfers with them, but, mm. you know, late last year, the CBN came out with the Naira for dollar, you know, policy, and they essentially asked local money transfer agents to... Um, disburse remittances in foreign currency. Now that means that they need to either hold dollars locally or source it. And given the issue of sourcing dollars in mm. Nigeria, people like Wise decided that, you know what, it's not worth it. So regulation and the rules around money transfers also plays a very big role. You look at fraud as well. Um, PayPal is still not, you know, allowed in, in Nigeria. And even you know some people trying to make payments from abroad for Nigerian businesses, their bank cards sometimes get blocked, right, because of fraud checks. So, outside technology, there's still a lot of work to be done around security, regulation, and a lot more as well. Mm. Uh, what's the timeline if you're looking at improvement in in in, uh, in, in cross border payments? Do you think uh, a five year, three year, ten year horizon is too long? In today's fintech world, it looks like twenty four hours is a long time. Yeah, so it's pretty hard to um, predict the pace of innovation. But I think what we're seeing is um, a few companies at Series A level that have an MVP. They are really trying to test and see what works best for the market. And I would say that, you know, in three plus years, we'll be able to see what sort of impact that they have had on that space in the continent. So okay. I'm quite optimistic. Th thank you so much, Michael Famaruti, the uh, uh, Chief Economist at Steers Business. Thank you so much for being part of this breaking news this morning. You're yeah. here in our studios when Equinix uh, uh, says it acquires West Africa's main one at 320 million US uh, uh, dollars in valuation. Equinix is listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange in the United States, moving now into the fastest uh, markets in Africa. Main one has data centers. Investors uh, will benefit from this. There's an undersea cable from Europe to Africa. Equinix is acquiring uh, main one digital infrastructure uh, uh, for 320 million US dollars. Funke Okweke, who is the owner of uh, main one founded by that Nigerian entrepreneur, uh, says this is a very big business. And according to her, she said, we look forward to building our next chapter together.